the unseen world of the Bible, session 16, Ruling Over Angels, the 12th of February, 2023. We have some objectives for this morning's discussion. First, we're going to review 10 promises in the book of Revelation, and then try to explain the obscure symbols in it, anticipate an exhilarating, everlasting life, whilst we keep on training now for our future responsibilities. Remember, you can always download the document for this session, as well as the PowerPoint slides, on our website. We have a theme for this lesson taken from our book. We will be living the life Eden offered. We will be busy enjoying and caring for what God has made side by side with the divine beings, those that remain loyal to him. Well, what is this about? We will judge angels. Someone read for us the text. The Lord's people will judge the world. You are to judge the world. Do you not know that we will judge angels? Oh, we're going to judge the world and judge angels? I thought it was God who will judge the world and judge angels. What's going on here? Say it again. Several judgments, maybe. Oh, okay, that could be. <clears throat> if think back to the book of Judges. What did judges do? Several disputes. <laughs> Settled disputes. Yeah. Ruled. They ruled, gave leadership. What else did they do? They protected from enemies. And so this biblical concept of judging is different from that of modern jurisprudence, in which a judge is the one who listens to a case and then gives the punishment. So we're talking here about leadership, settling disputes, giving direction as well as any kind of decisions that are required. You are to judge the world. The ancient of days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. All right, so this was a prediction of the future. And as, as we understand then, this is going to be fulfilled in us. To be sure that we understand certain ancient biblical texts, sometimes it's good to look at how the ancients themselves understood the text. Because we really do not understand the Bible until we can somehow get into the mind of the Bible readers themselves, the ancient Jewish community and their neighbors. So here are a couple of texts from Jewish writings Wisdom of Solomon, well, it is, it's a book titled The Wisdom of Solomon from about the 2nd or 3rd century, maybe earlier, B.C. Out of nations, they rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Okay, this was talking about the future saints. <coughs> and then in another Jewish writing called the Jubilees, we have this text. As its progeny who become God's people sanctified out of all his nations, and that they would become a priestly kingdom and a holy people. All right. So at least those, uh, that epic of uh, Jewish writers seem to agree with our understanding of the similar scriptures. And if we want to go further, we can look into the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was gives us a, a view of what was being read and discussed right up until the time of Jesus, before the destruction of the temple. God will give the power to pass judgment on the Gentiles to his chosen ones. And it is at their rebuke that all the wicked of his people shall be condemned. The Dead Sea Scroll writers, they were very aware of the fact that much of Israel itself was apostate or mistaken about <clears throat> and the Dead Sea Scrolls, do they relate to the Bible at all as far as particular books and stuff or not? Yes, the Dead Sea Scrolls include a number of the books of the Bible and commentaries on those books, as well as documents on how to lead a believing community. And so 
and interesting. It, <coughs> what's interestingly is that it gives us an older version of the Hebrew Bible than what we had for a thousand years. So until until the 20th century, the oldest Hebrew Bibles that we had were from about the year AD 1000. The discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls, we now have copies of the Hebrew Bible that are a thousand years older, even 1200 years older. <coughs> and it helps to correct some questionable passages. Well, we are to judge the world, but we are also to judge angels. Which angels? All of them. All of them. Uh, but in, in particular, we're going to look at Psalm 82 about the dispossessed gods, the ones that we've dealt with so much in uh, this course. I said, you are gods, you are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Right, so those particular gods, they're going to be done with. They're going to, be, they're going to die. They'll be cast into the pit. And we may have some hand in passing judgment on them because they're the ones who have given us such a bad time down through the centuries, actually deceiving the nations into mistreating the saints of God. Secondly, we are a kingdom of priests. Turning now to the book of Revelation. The one who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him the glory and power forever and ever. All right, this idea of a community that serves as a God's reign, his kingdom, and serving as priests for him uh, is well known in the Hebrew Bible, for example, Exodus. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israel. Uh, well, what is a kingdom? Any community that is ruled by a sovereign authority. It's different from a republic, although some, re I don't want to use that term, <laughs> in a republic, some politicians seek to rule over us as though they were sovereigns. They cannot give decrees, so they write memos. <laughs> but then we are also to serve as priests, not only individually, but as a community. What is a priest? As someone who has access to God, is able to explain God to other human beings, and then to represent those humans to God. So, in this kingdom of priests that we have become, and will eventually rule over the earth and over angels, we will be the go-betweens. And then to do what? Well, to serve God. There are God and Father. Why is it important to say both? Well, as God, Elohim, he created us, but he is also the Father of our Lord Jesus, who caused us to be born again into his family, becoming members of his divine council, his family council. Right? We're going to now look at Revelations 2 and 3, at each of those seven churches and the promises that Jesus Christ made to them. About five years ago, I decided it was time for me to learn the book of Revelation. So as I began reading through it, I found that those two chapters cover all of the main predictions that God has in store for us believers. And the rest of the book is kind of the dramatic outward of how it will come to pass. So, in Revelation 2.7, we read this. To the one who is victorious. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Um, oh, instantly clear? What does it mean to be victorious? But if we need some Bible verses to help, maybe 1 John, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. It's our faith. Okay, so faith in Christ, apparently, and remaining loyal to him, and further, elsewhere in the book of Revelation, we have the picture of the sea of glass. I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image, and over the number of its name. 
So this includes also those who will remain loyal to Jesus Christ in the end times when the beast will arise, assuming that he hasn't risen yet. Well, what is this tree of life he's talking about? Because everybody is thinking Genesis chapter 3, right? Let's look at that for a moment. The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay. So there was something about Eden. God had made a provision in the garden for us to actually live forever. It must have had tremendous health-giving benefits. A little like eating organic greens today. <laughs> uh, Jennifer has found wonderful ways to actually make them tasty. <laughs> so, um, so, deprived of that, it is now promised for us in the new Eden that's coming. So, God has made provision for us to gain, regain our health, a new body, and to live forever with Him. And then, of course, what is this paradise of God? Well, uh, Scripture tries to help explain this term you translate paradise. For example, here's what Ezekiel said. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Garden, paradise, translates the same word. And then uh, in Luke chapter 23, when Jesus said to the thief on the other cross, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Right. Okay. And then uh, to emphasize the fact that there are apparently various levels of the spirit world. We have in 2 Corinthians, where Paul wrote, I know a man in Christ, a Christian man, who was caught up to the third heaven. Well, golly, if there's a third, maybe there's a second and a first. It sort of gets, begs the question, was one of those paradise? So you're talking about the, tw the 12 different fruits of the tree of life. Are these happening simultaneously, or do we have one month of apples, one month of oranges, Bruce and retired, what, what's the deal? <laughs> or is it one fruit for one tribe of Israel, a second tree of tribe for another? Or about the followers of the 12 apostles? Commentators love to guess about things like that. Myself, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> the paradise of God, I'm just going to raise the question if perhaps paradise was not the upper level of Sheol. Because when Jesus said to the thief, you will be with me in paradise, remember Jesus was on his way into hell, what's called Hades. It would seem to have had two compartments, one called Abraham's bosom, or paradise, and the other for those who were really lost. But let's look at another promise in Revelation 2. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life and your victor's crown. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, well, there's several things in here. I will give you life. What kind of life are we talking about? This is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life or everlasting life life with him. And then the crown that he has promised us, here's what the dictionary says. The word for the crown here is a wreath made of foliage or designed to resemble foliage as an award or prize for exceptional service or conduct. conduct. Thus translated prize or reward. And the second death well, is defined for us in Revelation 21 as the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. You and I are never to be harmed by the second death. Well, we go on to another church, and here we have reference to the hidden manna, as well as more. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it. Only to the one. And again, turning to scripture and to uh, 
uh, older documents, why was it, why does he call it, why does John call it the hidden man? Well, possibly because of something that was written in the Septuagint Apocrypha. Um, Second Maccabees, an apocryphal book, actually says about the man. Jeremiah came and found a cave dwelling, and he brought there the tent and the ark and the altar of incense. Then he sealed up the entrance. Jeremiah declared, the place shall remain unknown until God gathers his people again and shows their mercy. So it's hidden, according to Second Maccabees. And then we have another book, Second Baruch, possibly written in the first century CE or AD, but reflecting an older tradition. The treasury of manna shall again descend from on high and they will eat of it in those years, because these are they who have come to the consummation of time. Is, is, mana, is mana a machine, a flying machine? Mana? No, it was a kind of grain, a food grain, that came down out of heaven every night for the Israelites as they were moving across the desert. At one point Moses said, all right, we're about to enter the promised land, Canaan, and so the manna is going to stop. So gather up as much of the manna you can and put it in a pot. And then they open the lid of the Ark of the Covenant and they put that pot inside the Ark and shut the lid. So that future generations would know what the manna looked like or tasted like. Or at least know that it was there. And so that's why it's, it's, it's called the hidden manna. It's hidden in the Ark. And the ark was hidden someplace to this day, unless the Babylonians broke it apart for the gold. Thank you for your question. All right, what's this white stone about? Well, the white stone is very well known. Roman Greco world. Lexicons report it was a pebble used in voting, a black pebble for convicting a criminal, a white one for acquitting an accused person, or for voting for or against some measure or idea, often used in cases of injuries and other circumstances. And so, for example, the term is used in Acts 26 for the cast of vote against. So what do we make of this then? We will receive the white stone, not guilty, acquitted. And who casts the stone? Jesus. Jesus, he casts the stone, and each believer comes up with a white one. All right, and then he said, it's going to have a new name on the stone. The question is, well, um, is the believer's new name, or is it Jesus' new name? In other words, the voter, did he put his name on it and cast his stone into the urn? We have, for example, Revelation 19, the secret name. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. We are destined to exercise authority over nations. Hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Does this sound like we'll be exercising authority after all of creation has been restored to a perfect state, when everything will be beautiful and peaceful? But who are these nations that have to be ruled with a, an iron scepter? Millennium? Whatever the millennium is, it's in, that will be the time period or the conditions. The point is here, our rule will start while there are still nations that have to be subdued and brought into subjection to Jesus Christ. So authority over nations, of course, is our right to govern them. Let's look at this term authority for a moment. Here's what the lexicon says. 
the right to control or to command, translated authority, absolute power, or warrant. And so here we have uh, Nero and his wife exercising their sovereign authority, <clears throat> whatever thumbs down means, and then we will rule over them. So we'll have authority delegated from Christ. This is our ability to govern. Apparently we're going to learn some new skills along the way. And those of you who accept responsibility to provide leadership in any place in the community or even over your own family, you are developing the skills that you will employ in the kingdom. Then we have the morning star. This is the opportunity to govern. And it looks like I forgot to stick in the verses that actually explain that stars were believed in antiquity to be divine beings who had authority over nations. And especially the, uh, the morning star being the most important, the brightest of the stars. And so Jesus called himself the morning star, that is, the chief ruler. And he said, I'm going to give myself to you. You will my authority. Dressed in white, I was driving along one day in an African town. It just so happened there was a fellow dressed all in white, beautiful gowns on his way to the mosque, walking along the side of the road. And I didn't notice there was a very small mud puddle. And that man and my wheel met at the same time. Oh. I felt so sorry. I apologize for you, sir. Publicly dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Right. So, uh, this being dressed in white, uh, I'm just going to accept the suggestion of the Anchor Bible commentary here that to be dressed in white was a symbolic of purity holiness and honor. And of course, especially it was priests who were often dressed in white in the performing of their holy duties. Book of Life then, we will not be blotted out of it. The men's group once looked up all the verses about the Book of Life in the Bible, and it appears that everyone who is born gets written into the Book of Life. The only danger is to so offend your Creator that he blots your name out. So when he says, I will not blot your name out of the book, it means, don't worry guys, it's, it's life all the way. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also be acknowledged before my father who is in heaven. That's right, yeah. So even our, our, not only our personal testimony, our baptism is done before humans, at least those of the believing community, and then, for example, in the book of Second Clement, you know where that's at, don't you? Well, that was written in After the first early, late first, <laughs> early, early second century between Christian churches, where quoting Jesus, I will acknowledge him before my Father in the heavens. So Christians understand stood that verse as we do. The New Jerusalem. This is also promised to us. One who is victorious, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Well, we are to be made uh, pillars. Maybe we'll have to go look at some uh, ancient texts to find out what they were thinking about when the scripture called us pillars in the temple of God. Caryatid torch of the Odyssey in Athens. Look at those pillars in the temple. What did they look like? Okay. Paul had said elsewhere, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? That's what makes anything a temple. It's people. It's people in whom dwells the spirit of God. One of the fellows I coach on Zoom was talking about, in his country, almost every house has a, a spirit house out in front. 
And everybody going in and out of the big house always stops and said, greets the spirits living in the little house. First Enoch said, where's, where's Matt? The Lord of the sheep produced a new house, larger and higher than the first, and put it in the place of the first, which had been enveloped, and all of its pillars were new. Okay. Of course, uh, this new house, it is we, and the pillars in it are we. And here's what the Dead Sea Scrolls had to say about being ministers in the presence of God. He has established utter holiness among them eternally and become for him priests of the inner sanctum in his royal temple, ministers of the presence of his glorious innermost chamber. He doesn't use the word pillars here, but he uses the, the same temple language to talk about our service to Yahweh and the coming kingdom. Then, the new Jerusalem. Here's what Isaiah wrote. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. So there was this anticipation of a renewed Jerusalem. When do you and I get to go there, by the way? Well, here's what the book of Hebrews says. Someone would read for us. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn ones who are enrolled in heaven. So, there's the assembly. Elsewhere translate the divine council. There we are with the living God. There are the innumerable angels. And then, of course, the completion of a new Jerusalem when it will come down out of heaven onto earth. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, are following him on white horses. All right. Who do you think those armies of heaven <laughs> consist of? The holy angels. We and they together, we return with Christ as a conquering army. Right, you will sit with me on my throne. Now, where did Jesus talk about having separate thrones? Once his 12 disciples were asking him, well, what about us, Lord? And he replied, you will sit on 12 thrones, judging the tribes of Israel. What about us Gentiles? Well, we're going to have a throne as well. And apparently, it's his. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Where it says here, the translation says the right to sit. The term right is not in the Greek text. It just simply says, I will give to him to sit. Point is, give. It's a gift. It's not earned but rather this is the position that he has promised us. And then you will sit with me. Now this term, to sit with, is used in another judgment context in 1 Corinthians 6, 4. If you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? This term, a ruling from, is simply, do you cause to sit that is, grant them the authority to make their decisions for you. Every time I hear about Christian organizations going to the law against each other, I wonder why they do that. I uh, know sometimes there are millions of dollars involved. Right, so the term to seat someone, according to the lexicon, is to put them in charge of something, to install, to appoint, or to authorize them. And thirdly, it's going to be on my throne. Where in the Bible, even in the Hebrew Bible, did it talk about Messiah's throne? Psalm 2. Okay, there's one. Psalm 110. 110, we've got the Psalms. What I'm going to look at here is what Jesus mentioned in Luke and Acts. He talked about my throne. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. 
the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. So here we have the promised fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, which was to be fulfilled by Messiah. And so Jesus is the one who will sit on that throne. In Acts 2, since David was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. This would be the fulfillment of that. We shall see his face. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. I'm going to suggest you. We're going to serve him. Now, it sort of sounds like subservience. He is the boss, we're the workers. Uh, but look at, look at this biblically. The question was always, which God do you serve? So I've gone into Indian restaurants, and often in an Indian restaurant, you will see uh, a God shelf. And I will, you, I will always ask uh, the proprietor or the waiter, if you know, she is Indian, which God do you worship? Oh, they're always delighted to tell you, well, I worship Shiva or Ganesh <laughs> or um, any, any one of them, since there are a million to choose from. <laughs> and um, so when we say we serve Jesus, remember, we serve no lesser God. We serve no angels. We serve no aliens coming down in flying saucers onto the White House lawn. <laughs> which we keep waiting to happen. <laughs> uh, nor do we serve another human being. So when we say we serve Christ, we are making a statement of privilege. And we shall see his face. Remember what God said about seeing his face? You cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. Have things changed? Well, apparently, for those who belong to Christ, we shall see his face. And his name is on his forehead. So there are folk who expect that we're one day, suddenly, the name of Jesus is going to be burned into our forehead so that our enemies can recognize us. But the scripture does say this, Wait until the angels go seal all of the saints by placing the name of Christ upon their forehead. Uh, probably it is symbolic for God recognizing that who his, his real faithful believers are. Somebody's wondering, all of this talk about authority and ruling, sitting on thrones, thrashing uh, nations, forcing the, the unregenerate to comply with the laws of God, that's wonderful, that's what we're really destined for. You know, we've had several of our folk pass away this year. Where are they now? What's going on in the interim? Last time we said, the Bible never says, when you die you go to heaven. Using those words. But those words are suggestive. Giving believers various ways to understand this, and here are some of the traditional views that we have come to accept. That somehow, on death, we go spiritually to be with Jesus and our saved loved ones. Is there any reason to believe that? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Present with the Lord, exactly. So we go to be spiritually with Jesus. And if our loved ones are with him, we'll probably see them too. What about to go reside in the heavenly Jerusalem? Any reason to think that we go to a particular place? Well, we look at the Hebrews 12 passage, whether it's eschatological or the interim is the question. Well, some say, well, we, this is where we will meet Jesus, in that city. He said he was going to prepare a place for us. That must be it. There are others who say, well, we go to paradise, just as the thief on the cross. But our question regarding paradise, well, where, where is that? And quite possibly, we don't go to paradise anymore. We go to the heavenly city. What would have changed that you would make that statement? So if so paradise was in the underworld, okay. the compartment where the saved went, because heaven was not yet open to them. Okay. And so, we don't go to paradise, we go to the New Jerusalem. It is the thought that at 
Christ's resurrection paradise was transferred? That is a certain understanding of Ephesians chapter 4, which would be a really fun text to look at. So um, anyway, keep that thought. That's a hypothesis that can be tested with Scripture. Remember, where did the scientific method come from? What really changed Western culture so that we became the scientific movement? A rejection of the unseen realm. <laughs> Certain scientists eventually rejected the realm, but most did not. Right. In fact, I have the results of a survey taken about 20 years ago across North America amongst scientifically minded individuals, those who had PhDs. And the survey asked them about their beliefs in God and the spirit world and the future. A believing PhD scientist who believed was the same as that for the general population. There's nothing about becoming a scientist that requires you to become a skeptic, a scoffer, or a denier. When we are studying the Bible, I recommend employ the scientific method. When questions come up, or we have it, we think we understand the text. Consider that to be a hypothesis. What might be true, it might not be true, or I just don't understand it well enough yet. And look for collaborating evidence in scripture, or in some cases in archaeology, or in ancient Christian and Jewish literature, which reflects the same understanding. Then go look at commentaries of more recent writers. Some say, well, we receive an intermediate body stored up for us in heaven someplace. The question always is, well, that body that Corinthians talks about, do we receive it during the interim, or is that the body that we receive at the resurrection? And some say, well, we go to receive our rewards while awaiting the resurrection. Sounds will be passed out, we'll be fitting them in an intermediate body, or will the rewards be given at the resurrection? Until I have not majored in eschatology. Right, there are some alternative views. Here's one you won't like. But there are Christians, besides Adventists, who hold to this. Oh, we will remain asleep or in limbo until we are awakened at the resurrection. You like it? Why not? Kind of solves the problem. Don't you someday feel that you need a few years rest? Yeah. <laughs> Hibernation. <laughs> um, myself, I do not adopt that view, but I realize that some hold it. And then there, here's one that really was surprised. One of the most effective evangelists, church planters I've ever known, who have done training in over 60 countries, seen thousands of churches started through his ministry. He believed this. He said, upon death, we enter eternity where time is no longer a question. It's not the ruling dimension. And we go instantly to the resurrection with no waiting. Now, you still get to meet Jesus. You still get to meet all of your departed loved ones. And you still get your rewards. But we don't have to wait around for centuries. By resurrection, he means a physical, physical body resurrection. resurrection. Yeah. yeah. By way of conclusion, then, I'd like to suggest that our destiny is to govern nations with our Lord. Along the way, we pass through coming to faith, we believe, we persevere, but eventually most of us will die. Then there will be the interim, we present with the Lord, waiting for the resurrection when our bodies will be changed, return to life, glorified. But then, that's not the end. We will have to be very busy, at least for a thousand years, governing and ruling over nations, which is only the first thousand years of the eternal reign of Christ. We will not lie around in heaven, idle and bored. Oh, next, next week, would you go ahead and read the conclusion in the book? There's more in there than I thought there would be, and we can use that as a springboard for something that interests me. If there's any topic, observation, any query that you would like us to discuss, just send that to me this week. By text, by phone, or by email. I have a question. You were talking about um, judging angels. Yeah. 
I voted to have been faithful and victorious. Mm -hmm. it, is it my understanding that, I mean, not all Christians faithful throughout their life and follow the will of God, and so there will be some that will govern and others that will have other jobs to do. Well, that, that's, that's a hypothesis. But as a class, as a group, the body of believers, our main task is to rule over, over the nations and then to go on into, I suspect, bringing into subjection the entire creation. Just a thought. Yeah. If you, five years ago, jumped into Revelations, you might want to share that with us. I want it's a class. Oh, this is a suggestion. Mm. This is a suggestion. I was reading a number of commentaries, and nearly all of them suggest that the book of Revelation is cyclical. It is not one long sequential set of events that happen, have to happen one after another. So I said, all right, if they're cyclical, what are the cycles? And then I found in a Lutheran commentary identifying that every cycle starts with a view of heaven. And then the view shifts down to earth, what God does on the earth. And at the end of the cycle, the view goes back to heaven with praise and thanks to God. So and then I went and looked at, well, if that's indeed the case, and the book of Revelation was written in the Hellenistic period, probably late first century, then what would have made the best sense to his readers who were Hellenistic, for the most part, Hellenistic Jews? And that would have been the Greek tragedy. And so I went into, I went to Wikipedia! <laughs> so what is the Greek tragedy? Every Greek tragedy followed a, a pattern. And the pattern fits the book of Revelation to the verse. 